Hi everyone, this is Adam. I wanted to make a few comments today on the Kalifornsky reading that we did in this section uh, about subsistence and technology. So just a few points that I thought were interesting. I don't expect that this recording will be longer than eight minutes or so. The, in this reading by Peter Kalifornsky, several different things are mentioned that are quite interesting. One of them, he says that in the quote, Old Denina Life, quote, they visited among all the different villages and told one another ancient stories. They told one another what plants are medicine and what plants they ate, what they learned of old stories that they heard, they passed on to others for them to make use of it. This to me, um, they advised one another how to travel in boats and make caches on overland trails. So all of this is showing us the Denina villages traditionally were not isolated from each other, but instead that there was a great degree of interaction as people traveled to different villages. Osgood talks about this in his ethnography at some length. As people traveled between different villages, shared news with each other, shared stories with each other, perhaps engaged in some joint hunting momentarily. Um, of course, married amongst each other. Um, sometimes people would move to another village based on clan or kinship affiliations, as we've talked about. And so there was a lot of interaction between different villages. And this is important, I think, and important to understand not just that, but that there also would have been interaction my apologies sorry my kiddos were speaking to me for a minute um, so anyways point is a whole lot of different interaction between these different villages groups were not isolated in that way and furthermore um, oftentimes groups entirely different cultural groups that were neighboring each other were obviously uh, trading with each other, sharing knowledge with each other. So it's important to understand those interconnections and not think that um, if societies were isolated um, or static prior to this modern age that, that we call globalization. Because uh, of course, definitely the connections across the world between different cultural groups has accelerated greatly under contemporary times, new technology, certainly uh, with web-based technology stretching across most of the world. But that's not to say that traditionally groups were isolated from each other. So that's just important to remember. Uh, I like too what he talks about, about what they learned from old stories that they heard, they passed on to others for them to make use of it. So the idea of telling stories to use them, to do something with them, not just as sort of for whatever, but that these traditional sacred stories had a purpose and a, and a power. He talks about fish weirs, which will be talked about in the lecture by Boris, which I'm sure you'll find very interesting. Again, uh, as we talked about last week with this idea of cold storage, uh, fish weirs are another good example of the fact that a technology doesn't have to have electricity attached to it or a fossil fuel attached to it for a technology to be sophisticated, advanced, take a long time to figure out how to make, uh, and do its job extremely effectively. So when we talk about advanced technology, what do we mean by that? Uh, and certainly I think we should include things like fish weirs as types of advanced technologies. Uh, they talk also about the ways in which uh, the keshka, or what's being translated here in English as chief, would estimate how long their salmon supply, their fish supply, would last um, that they'd put up and that they were storing in caches until uh, through the winter when you couldn't fish to the same degree. And they talk about measuring it, uh, the one day's allowance of food based on a dry piece of dry fish from the meaty part of your palm at the base of your thumb to the tip of your middle finger. Uh, so there was a very systemic or systematic order here. And I think that's important to remember that hunter-gatherer societies, foraging societies traditionally, um, are practicing stewardship of their resources. And not it's not just sort of a whatever you eat that day, but there's an incredible amount of planning and forethought to this kind of a lifestyle, to this kind of a life way. Um, he does make note of the fact that once new types of nets that no longer relied on spruce roots were involved, then they put up fish well. Uh, so he both acknowledges the sophisticated technology that was already in use, but then also the fact that in specifically the area of netting, uh, the new type of netting was more effective in putting up a larger amount of fish. Uh, I liked this point about what they did in the winter traditionally, he said, and they celebrated. Those three simple words I was really struck profoundly by. It may just be me as somebody that uh, struggles, uh, emotionally speaking, when I have less sunlight in my life. But uh, I think for some of us, we sometimes dread the winter, right? Some of us, self-included, have things like seasonal affective conditions. Um, and that can, you know, that can really hit us hard. And I think it's interesting, though, this idea of winter as something to celebrate and not just something to dread. Uh, right now, I'm sort of in March, and my first 
uh, Alaska winter and sort of, you know, when's the snow going to melt kind of feeling. Uh, but it's important to also think of winter as a time of celebration. To That's another way in which we adapt to our landscape is not just adapting in terms of food and dress and shelter, all of which we're talking about at length these weeks, but also in terms of how we think, how we think about the land, how we think about the weather. That's really what I had to say today. Wow, I came in at five minutes, not eight minutes. I hope you found it interesting.